Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. All right, Reed, today we're going to branch away from operations and maintenance slash logistics career fields and go all the way to the six series, which we haven't touched yet. We're specifically going to bring an interview here about the contracting career field, the AFSC 64 Papa, and my friend, Captain Brent Nichols. Yeah, I really enjoyed this interview, and it, I hope our audience can take away some things about contracting that they didn't know before, especially, well, first, that it exists and how important it is. I gained a much deeper appreciation for this role when I went to OTS and was able to interact with a bunch of officers from different career fields. Had no idea how important it was, and we'll get to that when we get through the, the meat of some of the things we talked about today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so grateful to Brent for his willingness to do this interview. As the audience will shortly find out, you can hear the enthusiasm in his voice. He loves the Air Force. He had such a great time, both as an enlisted air traffic controller, and then uh, later on as a contracting officer. And through it all, he had such vigor for the mission and, and for airmen. And playing the game as best as he possibly could. Yeah, and it absolutely comes out. He's gone on to do a bunch of exciting things, and I know he'll talk about that in his interview. So with that, Colin, why don't we turn it over to you two? Brent Nichols, say hello, sir. Hey, Colin, how are you? Good. So I'm really excited about this interview for a number of reasons. One, Brent... I'm looking at you right now. You're just, you're, you're a, a smiley, happy guy. I can tell that there's going to be some really good content coming from you, but more than that, you sound exactly like my brother-in-law. Yeah, good looking guy. I'm sure too. He is, he is indeed. <laughs> it, you look and you sound just like him. And, you know, I think he's a, a wonderful person. His name is Matt Wolferts, you know, shout out there to, to Matt. And uh, I, I'm excited to hear your take on the air force in his voice. It's going to be amazing. That's great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited for it as well. Thanks for having me. Well, I don't want to belabor that uh, that much. I want to get it over to you, let you introduce yourself to our audience. And I want to, you know, quickly set the stage with, uh, hey, Brent, what are you drinking tonight? No, uh, Colin, I'm glad you've asked. Um, I am, a, it, for some reason, podcasting just makes you feel like you got to have a beverage. And so what I have tonight is I got an O'Fallon Dad's uh, Oatmeal Stout. Never had it before. We had it as part of a, a work exchange of beverages during the holiday time. So I felt like tonight was the night to break it out. So that's what I got going tonight. You never had it before tonight? No, no. I've found myself only grabbing a beverage when I'm podcasting. And so I don't go through them as much as I'd like. I need to I be podcasting more. But uh, Yes. Y yes, you should. Have you had it? I have not. In fact, uh, I have never touched alcohol in my entire life. You know, I was I, I was Facebook stalking you, so I was wondering if you had <laughs> if you had, had a beverage before. All right, so I got to tell the truth here. I have had alcohol twice in my life, and both of them were on accident. <laughs> Did you know right away? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm going to tell you one of the stories. The other one I'll keep to myself. But the one, it was. While I was on, on active duty, it was one of those uh, lunches where we uh, go and celebrate somebody's promotion or going away or whatever it was. I don't remember the exact situation, but I remember that we went to this hibachi place where they you know, do all the theatrics with, on the grill, right? And the, the chef was going around like squirting this, uh, what I thought was a bottle of water into everybody's mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> and he gestured me and, and like, do you want some? I'm like, sure, why not? And he squeezes this thing, you know, like full on like blast it into my mouth. And I'm like, this is not water. This is burning, <laughs> this is burning, <laughs> burning, burning. Yeah, it was definitely sake. 
uh, <laughs> uh, that's a, yeah, that's that's a good uh, exposure to alcohol. You'll find out real quick what the deal is. So. Yeah, but uh, you know, not to be left out in the cold. You know, I, I am also drinking uh, my beverage of choice, and that is a Dr Pepper. Outstanding. Well, mine has less caffeine. I'm I'm going to be going to bed after this, so. Uh, I should be in good shape. All right, man. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad we uh, touched on your beverage of choice for the evening. Now let's uh, cut it to you directly, your background, your experience with the Air Force. Why don't you tell us who you are and where you're from and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Colin. Yeah, even though my face doesn't say it, I'm no longer active duty for those that don't know. But I started out about 12 years ago as an enlisted member and I was an air traffic controller for about five and a half years working towards my commission, went through OTS and rolled out as a contracting officer. Did that for about five and a half years. I was at Davis Mothin for a stint for my operational assignment, as I said, did a stint in the deed in Qatar and wrapped up at the National Reconnaissance Office just outside D.C. a little over a year and a half ago. So that's my Air Force life. I actually grew up Air Force. Uh, 23 years, my dad did it. And I, I was an ROTC guy through and through. In fact, I, I was on, my, on the path, you know, I was full ride scholarship, ready to rock and roll, went into my sophomore year and uh, a girl rocked my world. And uh, long story short, great story that, you know, that I've probably told a million times that in, culminates with me losing my scholarship, but I get the girl, ended up marrying her. We've got three kids. I, for sure worth it, right? But it's also like, man, I think I could have done both. <laughs> <laughs> I was not an idiot. And so uh, regardless, I, I was. And so we went, we moved to Missouri. I played baseball for a little while in college and eventually started a family. Was, I, and Air Force was for me. So I enlisted and I knew the path was there to become an officer. And it just took a little bit longer. And, and that's, that's the path I fl that flew and, and it worked out. So that's where we ended up. Yeah. So you, uh, you're one of those that actually did both ROTC and OTS. Yeah, that's right. There, there's not very many of those. Well, ideally, you don't have to do that. I will say when I did ROTC, you talk in 2004, 2005, you, you get selected for field training, you're commissioning. And from my understanding, it's, it's since kind of changed a little bit, which is, um, you know, makes it a little bit more competitive, which is fine. I think the cream always rises anyway. But it's something that I didn't have, I didn't have to deal with. The path was set for me. And I, you know, and I, I, I took the long way. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And then uh, you knew that you wanted to do OTS from the very beginning. Uh, so how did you set yourself up to be successfully selected for OTS? And how many times did you have to apply before you got picked up for it? Yeah, good question. Because it, I think if you're an 18 year old coming in and you have these ideas of going into OTS, it can be kind of foreign. Or, you know, do you, you got to kind of figure it out as you go along, you got to see people to go before you to, to do it. And the first thing that kind of exposes you to what it's like to build an OTS package is senior airmen below the zone. It's just that, that first thing where it's like you're building these bullets and, and you're going to be stacked up against people and, and you're going to get selected. And it, it means a lot. And I mean, all it is is put on rank six months earlier, but it's a big deal. And so for me, I joined a little bit later, had the ROTC background and not that I was a bullet hunter per se, but I was certainly strategic in how I spent my time pretty early on, the time types of things I volunteered for, you know, wrapping up my degree. You know, I, I had 176 credit hours when I did my undergraduate degree, which is, if you're doing the math, it's not, that's too many because you, but I went to so many institutions, <laughs> each one of them are like, you need to have this many credit hours. So I finally was able to finish it. And as soon as I did, I was able to just build that package and do a ton of research and, you know, airforceots.com, the forum that was certainly a, a good resource and, and just went through the rhythm at that. And at that time, that was, if it, it wasn't that long ago, but gosh, it feels like it the way you had to do it. It's going to the education office and having the education guy assist you. They got a, you know, FedEx next day, your package over there. And it's a nerve wracking process. Wow, you just, just click submit and, and you're, you're good to go. So it's like, it's kind of like oh, back in my day, this is how OTS was. And it, it, it just does feel a little bit like that after helping a few folks get their OTS package together. But it, I think I had a really good feel of how I stacked up, rolling into it, getting the firewall fives, doing all the things and saying, all right, this is the best. This is the best I got. Take me or leave me. Yeah. Yeah. I want to explore that just a little bit more uh, you, being strategic with the things that you got involved with. 
you said you, you don't want to actually call yourself a bullet hunter, but you were intentional, you were purposeful about getting involved in, in such a way so that you could set yourself up for success. Would you mind giving like an example or two of some of those things that you feel really set you apart from your peers so that you would be selected for OTS? Yeah, I when you look at Airmen coming in, that first 18 months, and uh, correct me, well, you may not even know because it's this is very enlisted thing. And, and a lot of times it, it's kind of not something that I don't think officers even realize. But if you have an airman coming in from school, I believe it's like 18 months before their first EPR. And I don't know if it's still that way. I know they've been, they've shaken it up a little bit. And so there's, you have a big lead time between when you get there and you're like getting your feet under you, you're getting your, your, your lunch handed to you because you're a trainee or whatever. And you're figuring out life. And eventually was that EPR comes around, you got your supervisor, E5, being like, Aaron, Aaron, so and so. So you, dude, you got to get some bullets, man. You got to go volunteer over at the airman's attic or you got to go do, you know, you're, there's these kind of check all airman against truck driving was a big thing when I, when I was in and you're, there's things that you do and those are fine, but they're on every single person's EPR. But for me, I was, I was trying to find differentiators. Okay. I know I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend my time volunteering and doing the things. What are the things I'm going to do? So I did things like, I ran a golf tournament. I knew, I knew, I knew a lot about golf. So I put, I did a, and I saw so something I enjoyed. Man, you really were setting yourself up to be an officer. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. I did what I was doing. No, and again, not, not with the, oh, I'm going to do this because this is going to go to my OTS package. I'm like, this is a differentiator. You have an airman that can roll in and run an entire golf tournament. We, we raised like $12,000. It was just different. You know, it wasn't hard, but it was just different. And so finding differentiators, was was key it would fill in the boxes on an epr is not hard i remember joking with one of my airmen when i was a staff sergeant about he's like i don't have any bullets i don't like volunteering i don't like doing that stuff and then we started going through his daily life and he was the guy that he fixed everybody's car in the unit the car guy right and i'm like dude this is thing that showed his service attitude towards the unit and the money he saved people and, and things like that and so uh, being creative, knowing your talents and, and, and leaning into them because he had a great time doing that. Oh, and he wasn't all laid up about the Air Force. But once he realized, oh, the things that he's already doing in his daily life makes him a solid airman, he's like, okay, this is all right. This is fun. So finding those differentiators was, was key, I think. No, that's really good. And I love that, one, you you took the time to figure that out, think about it, you know, assess what the situation was and you know, develop a, a solution while you were an airman, but then you continue to use that skill to help other airmen once you became a commissioned officer. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot. Of, I got to do that more as an officer, but certainly as a as an NCO, I got to begin to experience what it was like to an airman it looks up to you, even if it's in a small way. Okay, you've been there before, you've done the thing, and they're going to listen to what you say. And so, wielding that power wisely meant you know, finding airmen that are, that are worth spending your time with and, and then and then rolling up your sleeves and writing packages. It, 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 I'm sure you've done it. It's hard. It's hard. It's a lot of work. I got really good at it because I had done it so much. But man, even if a kid's saying, I, I don't want airmen a quarter, I don't want any of that. They're, the smile on their face and, and the pride they feel when they're hoisting the, the hardware is evident, you know, and, and it does more than just recognizing them. It, it ignites a fire that maybe they didn't even know was there. And so that was exciting to me. Well, and part of it, maybe they're, they're saying that they don't want those quarterly awards or whatever, because they don't have that passion that you're talking about for the things that usually get those awards. But if you can highlight the things that they're already doing or the things that they are passionate about and turn that into a competitive bullet that will get them the, the quarterly award, then they're going to put a lot more value into that award because they're being recognized for the thing that they are passionate about, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think too, there's some great leaders. I've had some great supervisors in my life, not only enlisted and super as, as an officer, but I've also had some, as everyone's experienced, some very poor ones. And I was an overload of those when I first joined and air traffic control was a very interesting environment in terms of eating your own and, and, you also encounter a lot of airmen. It's like, I don't want to ask somebody to do that for me. You know, I don't want to put that burden on them, you know, because it's an environment where you've been made to feel guilty. If I do something for you, then you owe me, you know. And so if I had an opportunity to completely serve an airman 
and just say, dude, this is my job to, to make sure you're taken care of. And let me be clear, you owe me nothing. Just keep doing what you're doing. If I could send that message in some small way, because I knew how important it was to me for people to send that message to me, dude, I was fired up to do that. That's awesome. Well, good. So you graduated from OTS and then you went on to be a contracting officer. Why don't you tell the audience about contracting and what all that means? Because frankly, the vast majority of people both in and out of the Air Force officer and enlisted have no idea what contracting officers do. Yes. No, this is great. This is someone, especially officers or whether you are a contracting officer or not, you are going to have to deal with our pain in the butts at some point <laughs> in your life. So you might as well get to know us and find a way to like us because we're going to be the ones that are going to help you or your vision take place because we're going to spend your money. So, uh, you know, to be honest, when I put contracting on my top three for OTS, I, I had no idea what it was. All I knew is that they had forgotten to hire for it the previous board and there are a couple career fields where there's some very specific requirements as it pertains to your degree. And this one, you had to have 25 credit hours that pertain directly to business. I had a business management degree. I'm like, okay, they forgot to hire. I know they need people there. I'm qualified for it. I'm going to go there and do that. So once again, you uh, strategizing, you were you're doing, <laughs> you're doing your research. You're like, there is no way that I am not going to get picked up for this. That's right. No, that's, that's, that's a hundred. I just wanted the brass man. And so I figured <laughs> out the rest after. And at that point I w had two kids. And so rated positions weren't as attractive as maybe they would have been, especially as I was in ROTC. And so got picked up, did contracting and contracting they just throw you right in the unit here you go and then at some point you go to tech school but it's not even really tech school but bottom line in short we conduct business with the outside world with contractors with um the services the, the commodities the construction anything that needs to be bought that we don't organically make ourselves or as we would say in contracting it's not inherently governmental that's what we do and we spend the government dollar and so that's what and that's where how we do it is by being stewards of the government dollar we spend it and and we are a necessary function in order to make sure those dollars are spent appropriately we could certainly go into <laughs> to all that, but really you think about any unit, you think about LRS, we got to outfit this whole new squadron with, with furniture and TVs, this, that, and the other. And we don't trust those LRS officers enough to spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, all right, I'm going to go walk over to contract and say, hey, I have this money. They're authorizing me to spend it. Can you go compete it and make sure that we're getting a good price? You know, and then all it works all the way up to the types of construction that you see and and you're, you're competing with industry. We're, we're heavily involved with small business. And that again, that's all operational level. We're spending the money. Our customers are you. Our customers are the units out there that need stuff. And we, we're serving them uh, the best we know how. And I think a good contracting officer and good execution has a clear understanding of what you need. I'm able to materialize that into a RFP or a request for proposal. I'm able to put that out to industry and I'm about to say, I mean, I'm saying, give me your best shot. Tell me your best price and we'll pay you. There's a wide array of things that go beyond that operational assignment. Enlisted folks, that's their experience. They're right there at the operational level, making these installations run. Officers, we get the opportunity to broaden out. We do things that are, you know, the next assignment is typically called systems. Systems level is just bigger stuff. I was in the National Reconnaissance Office. We bought spy satellites, you know, and you can imagine how quickly the money can go up. You're buying $100,000 in supplies one minute, you're buying $100 million in microchips for a satellite the next. So, and then we're spread out all over. We, when you think about, it, we do business with places like Boeing and Northrop Grumman and Oracle and all these massive, massive government contractors. And, and we're the conduit there. We're the ones putting pen to paper saying, yes, this is a good deal. Let's go do business. And so that's the super truncated snapshot. No, that's awesome. So just to kind of summarize a little bit, it exists to spend the government's money on behalf of the Air Force. Yes. And it's a checks and balance system, so to speak. You know, my first assignment, I had the rescue squadron had their own idea of what they needed to do their job. 
Oh, oh, of course they did. <laughs> I need this Bowie knife and it needs to be this size. And, you know, like, I'm like, hold on, hold on. I got to go check GSA. So bottom line is there's the federal acquisition regulation. And this says, this is how the government is allowed to spend their money. And so we are the gatekeepers. And so I don't subscribe to this idea, but I do believe this is true subconsciously throughout the career field. If you're a good contracting officer, everyone hates you except contracting. <laughs> <laughs> because you're making their lives miserable because I'm forcing you to say, tell me, why do you need that? And why do you need it to do those exact things and write it all down? And if I believe you, I'll help you. Which is so funny because I don't know if you've listened to the episode yet, but uh, in our managing resources episode, I went out on a limb and I said that the person that you need to be best friends with more than anybody else is the finance officer and the contracting officer. <laughs> you know, that's right on the money. And I'll tell you what, I was in, in 2015, I my perspective completely changed as a second lieutenant. I put on first lieutenant while I was out there. I was assigned with the EKEG, which is the uh, Red Horse and Prime Beef units out in IED and they're 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 that's where their headquarters out of and they're they they're all over Iraq, Yemen, Jordan, Kuwait, UAE. And so I got to be the sole contracting officer for them. Which is awesome. It was a blast. But I'll tell you what, when I walked in there, gosh, they hated me. And and for good reason, because that function had been terrible to them for a long time. If you think about these side officers, these guys over construction sites, their buildings and they're repairing runways and their their barracks and and, and hangers and all these things that especially I'm thinking about the red horse unit they're getting in there and they're doing the stuff so we can do the stuff you know what I mean and they got a contracting officer saying yeah we need three bids from three contractors I'm like dude we're in Iraq man don't talk to me about <laughs> bids these people are shysty I just need my stuff and they, they hated me and they didn't know anything about me they just knew I was contracting and I was going to be the guy keeping them from getting their stuff in a timely manner and a couple of weeks, couple of months go by. I'm super interested in trying to figure out how I can best serve these guys. And it turns out it's, it's this mutual education process. I'm saying this is the stuff I have to do in order to be able to get you your stuff. If you can help me with that, I can help you get your stuff. And and as I got a better understanding of what their needs were, we were able to help each other. And by the end of it, when they're rotating out, they're buying me drinks, you know, and saying, Dude, thanks for your help on that. And it, I probably made myself susceptible to being manipulated a little bit, <laughs> not in a, not in an illegal way, but like there's a, there's something that happens. If you're, if you're willing to work with me, somehow your stuff found, found its way to the top of my stack. And that, so there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, Colin. Yeah, well, my experience, so I'm a civil engineer. Okay. It, so, and I know exactly the, the EKEG that you're talking about. I was, I wasn't deployed with them, but I worked with them there in LUD. So as a civil engineering officer, I know exactly what it is that you're, you're describing because we cannot do our job without the contracting officer. It's not possible. It just isn't possible. And so my experience, uh, both, you know, home station and deployed was that the busiest person on the base is not the wing commander or the squadron commanders. It is the contracting officer. Well, that's what they want you to think, Colin. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe the couple of contracting officers that I worked with really just uh, were selling it to me or they were just losing their ever loving minds because they were so inundated with all the work, all the requirements. And so that's really where I was coming from is like, how can we mutually help each other? How can I, get you the stuff that you need so that you can get me the stuff that I need so that we can together actually accomplish the air force mission. Yeah. You see it big time in CE you you've lived it and I've gotten to bump elbows with young officers in CE running these projects on base and, and, you know, I joke and say, uh, yes, we're, contracting is always busy. It's under man. There's more requirements than there are people. And that's, that's certainly true, but whenever, and nobody likes you and no one likes you. So there's whenever a trust can be built though, there's certain things that can be delegated. There's some, as a, as a, as a CE officer, I'm able to give you things and authorities to function and, and allow your project to continue to run. And there's ways that we can learn to communicate that can allow us to keep things churning. Now, if I'm a controlling contracting officer, like many contracting officers are, and it's a flaw of our career field because we carry the hammer, 
if we say stop, guess, guess what, dude? Stop. And I have a feeling that that can go to our career field's head in a big way. And I think for as it pertains to officers, because I can go on a whole rant about civilians and, and, and the dynamics there. But as it pertains to officers, you can't buy into the hype. Yes, that's true. You got the hammer. And yes, ultimately, you can make them dance if you want. And because you, you're going to do what you need to do to get the job done, you are going to dance. You might not be happy about it, but I got to do what I got to do. And if this guy's standing in my way, money is a weird thing. It's one of those things where contracting has two lines of authority. I have a military line of authority, and then I have my the line of authority that runs to the Secretary of the Air Force. The reason for that is General so-and-so can't walk in and say, no, dude, you're awarding this thing right now today. Deal with it. And so you're right on in terms of developing that relationship, but hopefully it's authentic, right? Hopefully it's like, yeah, we, we see what each other needs to be able to do our job. Let's work together and make it happen. Yeah, obviously you're not going to you know, jive and, and be able to have a perfect match and be best friends with every contracting officer and every civil engineering officer or any officer for that matter. But you can at least you know, come together and focus on the issue at hand, which is, hey, there's this requirement we have to get this mission done. How can we help each other at least move toward that goal? And once that's done, we can both part ways, shake hands and never have to see each other again. But generally speaking, officers are pretty good people. You know, they're uh, service-minded. They want to help other people. It's not uncommon for officers to be able to bond together in a situation like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why the deplo- when you're deployed, it, it, it was just different. And, and, and it's one of the great things about deploying. It's one of the th- reasons I tell anyone that'll listen, dude, you haven't deployed yet? You got to go over there. I know you got a family. I had a family and it's not going to be easy, but you got to go because you got to taste what it's like to be in that brotherhood and that strength to be able to be around those people and, and just do the thing you got to do and, and people celebrate around it. And uh, I, I wish we could mirror it more at home. It's not always that easy, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, you know, home has different pressures, different things that pull people's attention in other directions. When you're deployed, it's much easier for everybody to focus in on that on that mission. So totally hear you there. So we have a, a little bit better understanding of what the contracting officer is, why they exist, uh, you know, who they typically work with, which is everybody. <laughs> But there are some you know, particular relationships that are definitely stronger than others, such as civil engineering and contracting. What are some other things that you feel like people need to understand about the contracting officer? Yeah. One of the things that I think that people hear about contracting is that it's a career field that if you ultimately decide to get out, it can be lucrative. It's a common thought. And that may or may not be true depending on your perspective, but in general, as someone that has gone through the transition, there are a lot of job prospects that align directly with your qualifications, which is not something that can be said for a lot of career fields. So I think that there, when you have an understanding of the government acquisition process and you think about all the types of companies and people that want to do business with the government, you have a job, a knowledge base that is valued. And so that is uh, one of the common things that I, whether it be cadets coming in, just trying to get a feel, they're doing their little tour in the summers and whatnot, or understanding or talking to pilots who perhaps washed out for whatever reason, medically or otherwise. We got, we got a lot of pilots in our career field because it just seems like a place that breeds opportunity. And I would say that may or may not be true. I would simply do your homework uh, and really have an understanding of what it is that you want to do. If you don't have like a, this is what for sure what I want to do, then I would perhaps encourage you to look, look elsewhere. But w- one thing is I think about officership having been prior enlisted, this is a good thing and a bad thing. When you go into an operational assignment as a contracting officer, you are rubbing elbows with the airmen that are there, which is great. You're in the trenches doing the thing but when you begin to visualize maybe perhaps you're kind of figuring out what you would hope to accomplish as an officer i want to lead people and these are things i want to do the opportunity to do that is 
there's not as much opportunity as you would hope, especially as as much officers. Now, so there's a lot of humility that needs to take place there. You got to kind of humble yourself. Yes, senior airman so-and-so is me telling you how to do this because they've been doing it for for four or five years now. And you're here for two and a half, three years. You're not going to master it. That's not... But you have to remember that's not the point. Get try to get the best you can at it. But that's not the point. If that was the point, you'd stay here forever and you go to another operational assignment. You're going to do this assignment and you're going to leave and you're going to go to a completely different acquisition environment. When I went from spending hundred thousand dollars to a hundred million dollars, everything changed. Everything changed. <laughs> I, I so hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. It, but it, 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 was, it was in a good way. But it was like. Not all acquisitions was created equal, and so after that, what happens then? You go to DCMA, which is what? What's DCMA? DCMA is, uh, of course, like I always forget what the acronym is, but DCMA, DCAA are these agencies that are either either monitor uh, acquisitions in a big way. For example, I'm in the reserves. I'm in a DCMA unit where I'm literally there's, there's an active duty unit inside Northrop Grumman in Santa Clara. These are all over. So bottom line is you're talking about these massive contracts with these massive government contractors. We're embedded with them to help help them do better business with us. And so that's completely different. You're not writing contracts anymore. You're not doing acquisitions in the, in the same sense. And then become commanders at a much lower rank. You know, 04, you're, you're on the spot, you're ready to do your thing as, as far as commander. And then you're at the Pentagon for a stint uh, as a 04, 05. And then if and there aren't many, uh, you you make O six. You're you're completely detached. You're you're making policy at that point. So you go from this this young officer. You're in the thing. You're doing the thing. You're learning it, and then you're completely yanked out, and you'll never use it again. And so finding that balance between rolling up your sleeves, being being willing to show that you're you can do it, but also understanding the end game. This is not what you're here for as an officer. The roles are different. It, it's it's difficult. It's, it's hard. It's not, it's not, the playbook has not been written. The path that people have taken has been different. And there's been, there's a lot of hardship that comes from it. If you fight the system, so to speak, but on the flip side, because you know, by nature we're, we're doing business with the outside world, we got to be agile. And so you can be part of something. If you can find some efficiencies, people are going to listen to you. And so my experience is, we engage each other, the enlisted force, civilians, big DOD. We engage them all very differently than other career fields. Other career fields can be very siloed in their world. I'm thinking about uh, maintenance officers. Like that's their world, man. They're in it. And they really don't got to touch anything outside of it. And it, they we're very different in that way. Yeah. Okay. So you did your operational tour and then you went to, to DC NRO. With the deployment in there somewhere? Yep, I was deployed. I deployed in 2015 when I was with my operational unit out there. And that's when I did six months with the with the Red Horse folks. Okay, cool. And then what happened after that? Well, I had been, transition had always been on my mind because, I, you know, I have an entrepreneurial spirit in terms of like, man, I'd love to have my own business one day. Or, you know, I stay, hey, I'm, I'm a guy that reads the Wall Street Journal and, and Fortune. It's just like those things interest me. and And so... Um, that world had, had been something I'd looked at. And so when I went to get my graduate degree and as many officers heard I, here, good time to finish your graduate degree is when you're young because it, you got the time you're useless. So <laughs> you might as well get a degree. <laughs> so I did that. I got my MBA at Washington state again with the mindset, Hey, what's the best degree type and institution that I could go to, to potentially prepare me for a transition. And so it was a good assignment in that the things that happen at the NRO are cool. It's a, it's, it's a cool place. And the officer core there is small. And so they don't really know what to do with you there. And so <laughs> it, sharing notes with people that have gone through there. I think there's a lot of assignments that are similar to that, especially in DC. When you think about the NSA and the NGA, they just don't know what to do with you. And so the, the development as an officer, it, the growth stunts waste than it should. And so it just kind of inflamed that idea. It's like, man, this is a cool place, but this isn't for me. It's just, this isn't the thing I'm going to do. That being an officer wasn't for you or being an officer in that specific assignment wasn't for you? I, I wasn't as narrow as to say this assignment wasn't for me because 
when I was up for assignment and my operational assignment in Tucson, I went to the commander's office. I said, sir, I, uh, when the VML, everything drops, I'm not going to accept the assignment and I'm just, I'm done. And he's like, he told me, he's like, I'm not surprised. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, all right. No, but he's like, I, I see the, I, he's like, I see the books you read. I see what interests you, and that 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 doesn't surprise me. And so, went back. We, there was some time between that conversation when the assignments ultimately dropped, and and we started kind of. My wife and I started talking. What, what would it look like? You know, if we did get a DC assignment, how cool would it be to go to these coasts? Maybe we give this thing another run. And ultimately, I took the <laughs> took the assignment just to give it to give it a shot. And I loved being an officer it, for many, many reasons. And unfortunately, the career field, it, it, the, the path could have been so much different for me. I don't know. It, but it, I didn't get a career field that jived with, with who I am, the things that I'm good at, my talents and, and interests. And as you look at that, that career pyramid, and I'm looking at those stops along the way for the next 10 years, it just wasn't me it wasn't the thing that i felt fired up to do and if i wasn't fired up to do the next nine years i wasn't going to do it just to chase a 20-year pension and i don't think that was fair to me and i don't think it was fair to the air force and so uh at that time it began to work through the transition and, and everything has gone great but when i look back i'm like man what could have retained me because i i was there saying retain me retain me go ahead air force you got me retain me. And I got a lot of comments from people like, Oh my gosh, you're getting out. They weren't the same conversation. Cause I played hard, man. I, I played very hard. And unfortunately my career field, I, I would say is not particularly equipped to deal with people like me. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, sometimes you got to let people do, do their thing. You can't spend a lot of resources on some knucklehead that thinks he's got bigger, better things to do. You know, maybe if that's what you got, do that. I wish the approach was different. And I, and there was a series of circumstances that had played out that are so funny to look back on, but I wanted to be an ROTC instructor. That was the thing I wanted to do. And when my assignment came up, I'm talking to the AFPC, talking to the personnelist. And by the way, just a quick aside, one of the coolest things about being an officer is you get to talk to them. You get to talk to AFPC. <laughs> enlisted you don't get to talk to them it's it's wild and not only do you get to talk to them they know your name and they know your history and, they, and they're they interested in helping you which was i thought super cool i'm, I'm talking to this guy named brian robertson that was there and i said i want to be at rotc and they had had a lot of slots open but they couldn't send me and what's funny is the next vml they had given me the option they said hey do you want to go to the spring vml we'll just put this off for a little while I was like, no, screw it. Just give me the assignment. Let's press on. And there's eight slots, eight slots, and they couldn't even fill them all in the next VML. And so I just thought the sequence of events was quite interesting how, how it all had worked out. And, and, and having talked to that, that personnelist even after, several years after the fact, it was just circumstantial. I got the assignment I wanted. I wanted to go to the NRO. So it just, they couldn't get me in ROTC. And what's funny is we had a, being in the DC area, you get to actually do some pretty cool things. So for folks that get to be in that region, you get to experience stuff. When people come to the Pentagon, which happens all the time, you get to be there for it. And there's, there's a lot of big names. And at the NRO, Elon Musk came and did a talk. Jeff Bezos came and did a talk. The uh, chief of staff came and did a talk. Chief master of the Air Force. Like we just, and these are all small like little auditoriums. We, it was very intimate. And so that, that was a huge benefit to be in that area. But the new personnel are there. And I'm like, I, I do all the things. I'm like, tell them, hey, I'm getting out. And they're like, no. And like on the spies, like, I can get you an ROTC. I, I can get you an ROTC spot. Would you take it? <laughs> like, no, I've already done the dance, man. <laughs> I can't deal with it. My emotions are just swaying. Well, you know, we just freak out at that point. So but I learned a lot through the process. I, I'm grateful to the Air Force. I am not resentful at all. And which is why I be, continued the conversation of the transition after getting out, because there's a graceful way to do it. To, <laughs> you know, you, just because you're thinking about getting out of the Air Force, I can sit here and talk to you and tell you how much I love the Air Force. I'm a huge recruiter for the Air Force. And well, I advocate for anybody. I'm actually working with a guy, right, Pat, right now, one of my airmen and my operational assignment, working on his OTS package. <laughs> and I love it. 
and I'll continue to do that. You can do that. You can still you can still do that and feel that way. You're not disgracing the Air Force, or you're not you don't owe them anything. You, you what you owe them is to put on your uniform every day and go work your tail off. That's what you owe them. Beyond that, you take care of you and do what you what makes sense for you. And, and if it, if that ultimately leads to a transition, which for everybody it does, it does. And so finding that peace was was important as well. Yeah. So how did you f- finally end up at the the decision and describe that tra- transition process for us? Painstaking. Painstaking, Colin. I'm telling you, started thinking about it very early on in my enlisted career. And, I, you know, you could go into different reasons. It, it wasn't necessarily hostile, but there were just, I found myself environments oftentimes where I'm like, I just don't fit. This isn't the thing. This is not the thing that I think I'm I'm, I'm made to do. And I can do it well, but that doesn't mean I need to just grit and go through 20 years all for the sake of chasing a pension. And don't get me wrong, that 20 year pension is valuable. I've done the math. All right. It it was was an important part of the the transition decision making process. But I knew I wanted to be an officer. And so I never really thought about it, I guess, seriously until I gave that officer thing a try and I was accepted. And like, you're going to go through that assignment anyway. It's they owe you for four years. And so about halfway through that, I'm realizing, oh gosh, this was not the right career field for me. This isn't the thing. And and at that point, I'm eight, nine years in the service. What am I going to do? I'm going to cross train, start over. It was already hard enough as it was going to being a highly qualified air traffic controller to become a stupid lieutenant that didn't know anything as a contracting officer. And in a lot of ways, it was a demotion (laughs) to, to to, to get a commission, you know, in terms of what kind of responsibilities and things you had. And so just kind of having those sensors out, do I belong here? What, what's the thing that I'm made to do? And is it this? And, and I would say it came down to this. And I think this is an important note, especially for young officers. When you look at where you're at developmentally as a leader at 28, 29, maybe 30 years old, you're, maybe senior captain, where you are at the Air Force, in my opinion, has taken you about as far as they're going to take you in terms of personal leadership development. Everything beyond that is on you. Your resume, as it pertains to the outside world, has been written. Think about the things that you you do in those first four, five, six years and what it took for you to become an officer. You are an attractive candidate to the business and corporate world. So as it pertains to being able to have livelihood, You've done the things. You don't need to put on birds on your put birds on your shoulders to 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 prove anything. And so, the weight of controlling that leadership development happens with things like starting a podcast, listening to a podcast, reading books, being around people that are where iron actually sharpens iron. And we're like, dude, okay, let's not stall here. Let's keep going because we're going to be commanders one day and we're going to want to develop people. And if we stay where we're at, I know I'm not good enough. I know I'm not good enough right now because everything that tells me a 30 year old doesn't have everything it takes to be able to, to be a leader of men and women. And so the air force is not, in my opinion, constructed in the best way to continue that development all the way to 20, 25 years. And so as I looked down that barrel of 10 more years, looking at my career field, looking what I thought the Air Force would be able to bring, not that I'm a consumer completely. It didn't it create a fire in my belly the way that I wanted. And I, if I knew that to be true, I needed to discover what <laughs> put a fire in my belly. I'm 30, yeah, I was 33 years old. I got a lot of life left to live. And so if I started bouncing, okay, I know when I want to be in the business and corporate world. I want to start my own business one day. The person I'm going to be at 43 versus the person I'm going to be at 33 quite frankly, is not all that much different. And again, this is a pertain to the outside world and the way they look at you. Uh, anyone, Reed will tell you in a couple months, the way a major gets treated versus a captain is different. <laughs> like it, 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 something happens, right? But that doesn't mean squat in the outside world. And so if I knew that to be true, now was the time. I, I needed to do it now or never. And so ultimately pull the trigger. I'm, I'm thrilled with, with the decision. And it's not because I don't miss the Air Force. I do a lot, but I felt like I was responsible to talk through and work through those decisions and, and land on the transition. And how long did the process actually take you from when you made the, the decision to 
the day that you finally separated from the Air Force? Yeah, 1 October 2018 was my day, and I dropped papers the 21st of February, uh, which is a funny story in of itself, because the day before I was in my boss's office advocating to go to another job within the unit, because it was time to transition. But I was, but that kind of goes with my, my thought of like, play till the end, man, go hard. Because once those papers drop, okay, papers drop, they go to my commander, I didn't really have a commander out there. It's kind of interesting leadership dynamic but they go over there and he, he immediately calls me he's like dude what the heck you know and i'm like sorry sir i didn't realize they were going to go to you right away but it was an awkward conversation the one time you didn't do your full research <laughs> yeah well i will say it is tough navigating it oh it's dicey man but when you once you people find out you're you're separating not a lot of people are like super fired up to help you with it. So, so you're, you're, you're on that road a little bit on your own. Okay. But I will say this as hard as it was, and it is hard, it's hard to communicate, but as an officer transitioning, especially when I think about younger officers, when you say I'm getting out at 10 years, whatever, you're making a big bet on yourself because the officer life is, is a good life for lots of reasons. I think you were well paid as Air Force officers. I think that the way you are looked at in the community is strong, much stronger than most. And when you can look at that and assess it and say, I still think I got something to offer. I want, I've looked at that, but I want, I, I have enough, I have enough sense of myself to know I need to do something else. As you transition you have a compelling story to tell. And unfortunately, that story is not that really great resume that you think you have, because we all got the same one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so being a good storyteller, understanding that and people willing to place that bet on you, they're going to win. They're going to, it's going to pay out, but you got convincing them to, to make that bet is not easy. And so uh, that was tough, but super rewarding because almost every company I engage with eventually I was able to get a job offer. Even after I had gotten a job, I had kept those contacts. And so I think that's an important thing to remember is like, yeah, you're doing great things. And if you ultimately decide to transition, that's great. People are going to pat you on the back, but capitalize on that story to tell, not, not just your resume. Yeah. And that's definitely one of the goals of this podcast is giving officers the opportunity to practice telling that story, what it is that they do, uh, what their experiences have been, and doing so in an environment that is geared toward a civilian population. Yes, we'll still throw acronyms around. We'll eat that, you know, acronym soup all throughout the show. But we try really hard here to explain things in such a way that the, the civilian population can understand. Because I believe wholeheartedly that every officer has an important story to tell all of our experiences are unique and the skills and, and ideas that we develop along the way are unique to each of us. Right. That's just a word of caution of like, don't buy into your own hype. I'm, we're all playing the game, right? We're all trying to figure out how what we did put a warhead on a forehead. But that's a game that you play inside these walls. And so when the time comes to transition, understand that no one gives a rip about that because it doesn't make any daggum sense. It doesn't. What can you do for me practically right now with the people and resources that I have? And so continuing to build those notches is important, but knowing your story and being able to communicate that and, and being able to sit across from someone and they say, oh yeah, this guy's going to get it. He may not like match everything we need on paper, this job listing that we have, but like, dude, this guy's got it. Give him six months and he'll be smoking anybody that, that did. And so the, the stuff you put down on paper will never, ever, ever do that. Just by the mere fact of being an officer and having a successful career, you're going to get a foot in the door. People are going to want to talk to you and have a conversation. If you keep spitting out the things that you did as it pertains to the stuff on paper, I mean, good luck, but you have something more interesting to say. They want to hear that. And so it was, it was cool to see that actually happen and, and that come to fruition and it, it'd be rewarding. I think it was rewarding for me. A good friend of mine, Jay, who was a Marine 04, kind of went through the same thing, same process. And he, he landed an incredible job at Facebook. And like, that's not supposed to happen based on what's on paper. What's on paper doesn't make sense. He was a troop commander. <laughs> now he's running a, like this operational security area over at Facebook. 
how did that happen? Well, he had a really, really good story to tell and he, and he communicated it. Yeah. Well, let's explore that just a little bit further. You know, how can officers who are eyeing the transition either within the next year or the next 20, what are some of the things that you think they should be doing now uh, or in the short or long term to gain this knowledge and prepare themselves to make that transition? Yeah, I think one of the things I've realized through the process is people should always be thinking about the transition. Always, 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 because you're going to make the transition eventually. And when you decide to re-up and you decide to take that assignment, I mean, what does that say about you that you're just blindly doing what the Air Force is telling you? That you're an officer, for crying out loud. If you can't lead yourself, how are you going to be a leader of men? And so, you know, have that conversation with yourself, with your family, and the, the people that are important to you. And even if it's very quickly, yep, I'm still riding this. I'm ready to do the next thing. Great. But at least uh, take an aptitude test in terms of your own understanding of what's out there, what the other opportunities are, and make a decision based on that. And so one, don't feel guilty about thinking about it. Just give it thought. Talk through the decision. People that have made the transition, people that have thought about it, There's you do not have to feel guilty in it. As long as you're putting the uniform on and kicking butt, you don't owe the Air Force anything beyond that. It's not a cult, man. At the end of the day, it's a job, very serious job that you're being asked to do. I mean, and we give up a lot of freedoms to, to ensure that the, the job's done well. But that's why there's these crossroads. Uh, you know, there's these forks in the road, so to speak, and you get to choose your path. So I would encourage people to think about it. And then when, while they're thinking about it, and even if you've made up your mind to transition, work your butt off until you leave. And not because you owe the Air Force that, which you do, how selfish of you to get paid and not do your best, but you're going to feel so much better. The anxiety I felt wondering if I was doing the thing that I needed to be doing in order to transition well. Am I, am I, going to, am I doing the right MBA program? Am I in the right LinkedIn groups or am I networking? Did it, it created so much anxiety. It made me a terrible officer. And it made me just a terrible husband in a lot of ways. It made and it didn't make me an attractive candidate for an outside job. So continue to play as hard as you can until you leave. And those things that you do do, whether it be reading a book, listening to podcasts, networking, things like that, just follow those away. They're they're all going to be there when you're ready to go. Uh, don't don't get anxious about it. And then. The, the, I guess the last thing being understand you're not the only one thinking it. In fact, like I said, I, if it's going the way I think it should, everyone's thought about it and people are on a spectrum of, of where they thought about it. They're like, no, man, Air Force, 20, 30 years, man, I'm going to be a, a flag officer. Great. Right on. Uh, and then to the other side of like, dude, I'm done. I'm fin doing my forward. I'm out of here. But you're not the only one going through it. So, you know, there's just communities out there. There's, there's places, there's resources to connect with people, to get the information you want, engage with your AFPC officer, let them know what you're talking about. These aren't career enders. You thinking about getting out, that, that was an interesting thing. I was like, ah, once they find out I'm getting out, I'm screwed. But they, they wanted me all the more. They're like, well, we want, we want to retain you. How can we retain you? I mean, that's their job. And so understanding that, you're not alone in that thought, I think should hopefully provide some comfort. You're not sabotaging the Air Force and you're not sabotaging yourself. You're just a normal person thinking about what's best. Whatever job you decide to do, just crush it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the challenging things, though, and you, you alluded to it earlier, but one of the challenging things is that as you are contemplating that transition, as everybody should be, is that while you're going through that thought process and once you actually you know hit the button drop the paperwork as it were you're surrounded by people who have never actually left the air force before and so they don't necessarily know how to support you in that process you know that's a great point and two things one don't expect them to they don't your commander that uh, you've built a good relationship with once you're not his anymore or once he finds out that you're not his like it's not his you you just you're not his problem. Like he doesn't need to help you have a smooth transition. Your buddy from across the hall who's already accepted his assignment and he's going to the next place and he that's not on his mind. He's not where you're at. 
he's got to stay focused on his his next thing. So absolutely, that's that's one of the was one of the really tough parts. And when I went through my own transition, it was extremely difficult for that reason. I wanted to just find all this stuff out. And so once I went through it and started meeting people also going through it, I, like I mentioned my buddy, Jay, there's just a lot that there's a lot of weight in these decisions that we put maybe perhaps too much, but as we went through it and we, we doing the networking and the interviews and the figuring out how to pick out a suit and, and resume building and all that sort of stuff, we're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. We're like, Oh my gosh, we just got a freaking PhD in transitioning. And as we're talking, we're hammering through it. And, and, and to your point, we realize, gosh, it would have been great to talk to somebody that knew, that knew what we know. It would have been so great. And so we did what you're doing. We, we start podcast because we're like, we have so much to, that we've learned and we don't know it all, but they would be insanely selfish for us to not be there to talk with people about the transition. And so absolutely a lot easier said than done when it comes to say finding that community, perhaps just the idea of knowing you're not alone can help, but Hey, you can come, come chat with me and Jay. We went through it. We love you. Whatever you decide to do, stay in, get out, whatever. But if you're thinking about it, it's really good to know what it's like. And we'll chat with you about it. LinkedIn's another great place where there's this huge community of, of either transitioning vets or, or people within major companies that their sole purpose is to onboard incredible vets and engage with them, you know, talk with them, figure out what it's like. Yeah. So tell us about your podcast. Oh, well, Colin, I'm just so glad you asked. This is called the Corporate Captain's Podcast. I, I, I do it Perfect. with my... <laughs> yeah, no... I'm a marketing guy, you know, I, we, of course I work, we worked on that forever, but I think it, it helps, you know, say what we want and that we are, we've made the transition. We're in the corporate world and, and we want to help people make that successful transition as well. And the podcast is strictly, is completely for 100% for officers, all services that for people that are thinking about going through or just on the other side of the transition into business to corporate America. And we cover topics from the decision factors, what are reasonable things to consider when you're thinking about that transition to working with recruiters, to resume building. And this is not a tutorial. This isn't an interview. This is us just hammering through our experience. This is what we experienced. And this is what I think is good, bad, or indifferent. And I think what we are ultimately come out of each episode, regardless of what we talk about is one, we're pulling back the veil on this weird thing, the transition that no one knows anything about. Like you said, you're surrounded by a bunch of people that are wearing the uniform. They don't know what the heck's going on out there. So try to, to solve the mystery, so to speak, for you before you do it. And then talking through what it would look like to, to have a successful transition. And um, some of the things that we talk about is, is what I mentioned earlier. It's like telling that story, man, like, and really just believing in, in what that looks like and, and what it looks like in execution. So we were about 10 episodes in right now and it's, it's been a blast. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm so glad that you made the effort to put these episodes out there. I've listened to all of them. I think that the story that you share, the, the discussions that you have with Jay, the principles and ideas that you highlight are just so important for any officer that is planning to transition out of the Air Force or, or any other service. And if they can't talk to somebody you know, directly face-to-face -face that has gone through the process or is going through it, then this is definitely the next best thing, right? Yeah. And I cannot recommend the, the corporate captains enough. It has been so good. I mean, I'm eyeing my own transition right now, not because I want to get out of the Air Force, but because I have to. But, you know, the things that you talked about in your episodes are things that I've already put in place for myself. I'm, I'm acting on a lot of your recommendations. So from me personally, I want to say thank you for putting out that information and setting me up for that type of exploration and transition from the Air Force again. That's great, Colin. I really appreciate you saying that. And I'm glad to hear it. But my 
my thought is, I mean, for crying out loud, we're on the, the commission ed podcast. Like if there's anyone that's like all air force, it's someone like yourself. And so my inclination is to believe that there's a chance you could be a lifer in the air force and you would just kill it and you would serve people really well. But there's also a chance as you continue to assess your own career as it stands right now, that it may not be that route and it might end up in corporate America. And you're doing what I want to encourage people to do. And not because I want them all to transition, because I want my Air Force to be as strong as possible forever. And I want to retain amazing leaders. But that's just not how it's always going to be. And so I want those leaders to take care of themselves well. And part of that is doing exactly what you're saying. I love to hear it. And I have zero doubt if you're a good officer you're capable of making a good decision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that, and just kind of putting your own trust in that. And, and unfortunately, you know, if you're not, if you're not a good officer, you, you end up staying in the air force for the wrong reasons, which is just as bad as is, you know, getting out for the wrong reasons. And so I, I would love to hear that. And I'm, I'm encouraged just that you've kind of just looking into it and doing your homework and just being able to make the good, best decision possible. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything that I've learned from you so far, it's that you should do your homework. You should investigate all options, find that way to differentiate yourself, to become proficient in sharing your experience and setting yourself up for success, regardless of what that path is going to end up looking like. It may be in the Air Force as a lifer, you know, go the 20, 30 years and retire as a flag officer. It may be you do your four years and out, and then you go and land a job with a Fortune 500 company, you start your own business, and you start killing it there. Whatever your path is, you were an officer at one point, and you use those skills to be successful in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're never going to have the answer. You're going to have the thing, you, but at some point you're going to be asked to bet on yourself and you can do that. Trust me, you got the story to tell and lean in and, it, and, and betting on yourself can happen inside or outside of the Air Force. Absolutely. Well, Brent, this has been such a fantastic conversation. You know, uh, learning from your experience, both as an, an enlisted airman and NCO, uh, your time as a contracting officer and explaining the, the black ops side of, of contracting, as well as now being on the outside of the Air Force and you know, pulling back the curtain, giving us a peek into what that is like. And once again, cannot recommend corporate captains enough. So I got two final questions for you. The first one, We've talked about the podcast, but where can uh, people go to get in touch with you to uh, send you that email to pick your brain about the transition, or maybe they're interested in learning about being a contracting officer or that career progression. So where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, great question. For one, make a great LinkedIn and then make and, and find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I will not be hard to find. I'm a bald guy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Burns and McDonald is where I work as well. So you'll kind of match Brent Nichols, Burns and McDonald. Find me, let's connect. And I'm more than happy to engage in, in whatever way. Captains at gmail.com. Nichols GG at gmail.com and 520-305-0935. Seriously, text me, call me, whatever. I'm just super interested in being able to help in whatever way I can. And I'm in Colin's group, uh, Commission Ed on Facebook. And so I think that you'll find if, if you feel like this conversation is like, man, I, I'd like to pick that guy's brain or like, I want to tell that guy's a moron. I'm, <laughs> I'm more than happy to, to engage on in, in any way. So. Cool, man. We're going to put all that contact information in the show notes. I really hope people will reach out to you and pick your brain because uh, we just barely touched on the things that you have to share both operationally uh, in the Air Force as an officer and again, that, that transition into the corporate uh, America world. Well, so my last question for you, what does it mean to be an officer? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think it, on the surface, it could almost sound cheesy, but I'm telling you, man, like everyone that has become an officer, like something hit them in their core that made it important to them because it's it's not an easy process where you go to the Air Force Academy or ROTC, OTS, whatever. You put up a lot of your time, money, and effort <laughs> to do it. And so um, I think it's important to, to, to take it seriously. But for me, maybe I didn't fully understand it until I became an officer, but it is the greatest platform for servant leadership that I've ever seen. And so the absolute 100% best experience I had was be able to serve airmen and, and, and find ways to celebrate them, find ways to help them problem solve, find ways to challenge them, 
find ways to and some, sometimes discipline them, you know, like whatever the thing was that would help them reach their potential and, and their mo- the greatest satisfaction in their career field and, and you know, in their life. That was what and not being an officer meant to me. And so uh, I had a lot of fun doing that and I get to do that in small ways still. So uh, that is what it means to me. That is awesome. Brent Nichols, thank you so much for taking the time to you know, share your knowledge and wisdom experience with us. And we're going to have to definitely do this again. Um, you know, pick your brain even further as, uh, as, as we continue to build uh, both this podcast and yours, getting people in, developing them, and then getting them out again, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's great, Colin. Well, thanks so much. You have a great night. All right, Reed. What's coming up on your mind first? So he talks a lot about separating yourself from the group. And it's something that you're going to hear a lot as a young officer. You know, you need to separate yourself. You need to differentiate yourself. And I think that is something we should talk about. How to do that, how to do that well. What does that mean? Because I heard it almost immediately upon entering active duty. And you have to do something to, quote, set yourself apart. Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, let's set the stage. Why is it that we have to differentiate ourselves to begin with? What does this have to do with being an officer, the way that uh, we perform, the way that we're evaluated, the way that our, our careers progress? Why is differentiation an important thing? There's going to be at some point, and there will be multiple points during your career where this will happen, where you have to be evaluated against your peers for retention, promotion, or for opportunities. And as we do in the Air Force, you generally are not physically present for these evaluations. It's going to be an evaluation on paper. We've talked about this before. In order for your paper to stand out from the crowd, you have to have something on that paper that A, the Air Force values, and B, speaks to the board and says, I am the person that you want to put in this position, rank, whatever it is. And by and large, a lot of OPRs look really similar. And you'll find this as the more you interact with these pieces of paper, the more you'll see, wow, you can really tell who is performing by what's on the page. And there are key things that really do stand out. And so if you want to make it in air quotes, you have to find a way to stand out from the crowd to kind of get through the noise to have the power to kind of direct where you want to go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. On the point of being evaluated against your peers, you are actually being evaluated constantly. You're constantly being uh, compared against everybody else, but there are these very distinct points in time over the course of your career where that evaluation that racking and stacking of you against everybody else becomes more or less concrete. That's your officer performance reports, your OPRs. That's any quarterly or annual awards, any letters of evaluation from deployments or training periods, things where stuff actually gets put down on paper is where this kind of stuff becomes concrete and really where that differentiation needs to stand out. And first and most important thing that's on that piece of paper as it stands right now is the stratification. What is the number one through N against everybody else at that specific point in time that is really important? What are your thoughts on on the stratification, Reed? Yeah, this is something that is, you know, actively debated and been talked about our whole careers. Uh, I know A1 is right now going through a big review of the officer evaluation system to try and get after this question. It does play a central role. And getting the right strats at the right time, as it stands right now, it'll make or break your opportunity to have certain opportunities, right? So if you want to be a commander, you have to have been stratified at certain points in order to get in the right position to make that a possibility. This is a super hard problem, right? Like I can rage against the machine and be upset about the system all day long, but it's the system we have. And when you pin somebody down and say, okay, what is a better system? 
the conversation gets really weird because people just know they don't like it. I've only seen a, a few different or better options, but they all come with their associated costs. And, and so I, this is a really, really tough problem. And a lot of smart people are putting a lot of time and effort into getting after it. And before we go too much farther, I do want to say that differentiating yourself looks very different at different points in your career. So I came into the Air Force with a master's degree. That's less common for most second lieutenants, but that didn't really matter at that point in my career. That will start to matter as we start looking at 05 and 06. So just because you do something that's good on this fake list that no one knows exists, but is very real, right? The unwritten rules of the game. That doesn't matter yet. It'll matter later. And so even the timing of these things that are on this list can be really diff difficult. So yeah, you got to learn what these things are and you got to go out and get them. And, and I appreciate how Brent talked about that. Like he knew what these things were because someone gave the list to him, so to speak, right? He kind of went out, sought some knowledge, but he also stayed true to himself. He didn't go out there just to check boxes and get done what everyone said he should. And that's a fine balance to strike. And I think he did that well. Yeah. And what you're describing is something that I want to highlight for our audience that with respect to the stratification and the, and the actual things that get put onto your OPR that become part of your permanent record, you have actually very little control of it. So with respect to the stratification and differentiation as a whole, you can't control the strat. That's completely outside of your influence. You do not get to write down on your OPR, I am number one out of 300 captains in, within the unit that you're part of. But you can still differentiate yourself. You have control of the differentiation, especially if you pursue things that no other person is doing that you can excel at, right? And so I would encourage our audience to find things that they are already doing, that they're doing well, that they have a passion for, and finding some way to relate that back to the Air Force for the better execution of the mission or the support of our airmen. Yeah, we hear it all the time, whole airmen concept. That's, this is an encapsulation of that idea. So absolutely how you can make that happen. And you can be really strategic about that. You, you can find things that no other person is doing that you can do better than anybody else and have that end up on your evaluation, on your, uh, your training report or anything that becomes part of that concrete permanent record as you move forward toward promotion, these different opportunities, or even the, the possibility of retention. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Colin, what is something that struck you that you wanted to bring up with our audience? I really liked Brent's how can I help mindset. This really came out as he was describing his time being deployed with the civil engineer group. If you remember in the interview, it we often highlighted the fact that most people, if they know contracting exists to begin with, they probably don't like contracting. Yeah, they're the bad guys. Right. You know, because contracting is, they're the ones that control the money. They're the ones that keep you from being able to do the things that you want to do, which involves money, right? But Brent tried to flip that on its head. Instead of saying, prove to me that you need this thing, he said, let's work together to find a way to get you the thing that you need, right? That how can I help mindset is huge, not just for his success as an officer and the enablement of the Air Force mission, but in the broader context for us as officers, thinking how can I help other people, other units accomplish the thing that they want to do. Yeah. I had a peer while I was at OTS who really taught me this lesson well in changing my perspective, changing the way I frame the problem, 
which is what I felt Brent did. He didn't change the circumstance. He didn't change the laws. He didn't change the amount of money. He changed the way people talked about the problem and how they addressed it. And my peer said, how can we get to yes? Instead of saying, here's the 50 reasons why we can't do this, it's what do we need to do to get to yes? Still recognizing those obstacles are still present. And I really liked that change in reference. It's still something I have to consciously decide to do to change the way I look at a problem. When Brent mentioned this perspective flip, that was the first thing I thought of is that I needed somebody to tell me, hey, you're way too negative. You're way too fatalist. You're way too, these are in my way. Let's talk about a, the same problem in a different way. How do we get to yes? And it absolutely can change the way that you are able to affect change. So yeah, big fan of that. I like what you're saying here. It goes into this idea how there are certain things that become both enablers or blockers of the Air Force mission and specifically the topic of resources. How you know things like money and manpower and even things like policy can help or hinder the mission, but really it it's more of like our mindset as officers and how we engage with those different things. Yeah, that was something that stood out to me that I wanted to bring up with our audience is the longer you're in and the higher up you go, the more important your ability to navigate HR, human resources, finance, money, contracts, budgets, all that kind of stuff becomes if you're going to affect change and lead your people. Your airmen probably don't care how excellent a pilot you are or how excellent a, an intel guy you are or her, how excellent you are at predicting the weather for weather officers. But boy, they sure as heck care if you're able to get them the right computer IT systems that will enable them to do their job more efficiently, right? So, or if they're an undermanned unit, your ability to find a way to, to squeeze more blood out of the stone and get another body to alleviate your manpower shortage. Those are the things that they're going to remember. Oh yeah, we were doing nights and we didn't have enough people and they commander was able to get these more folks in really made, that's what they're going to remember your wit, you know, your incredible intellectual grasp of the situation may not stay with them, but they will absolutely remember how you organize the unit, how you trained and equipped those kinds of things. And contracting plays a central role in that. Yeah. I like that you're highlighting how contracting is going to be central to, to all of this because everything costs money, right? Yes. Fact of life. <laughs> and contracting handles the money. Finance budgets everything and they keep track of the, the burn rate on, on all of the dollars, right? But contracting actually signs the checks. They're the ones that interface with the outside world and actually go and buy the thing or put out the request for proposal or do the hiring, right? They're the money bags. And if you don't have an understanding of how contracting works or just the idea of contracts, if you don't follow through on your mandate as an officer to manage resources, then you're not being as effective and as efficient as you possibly could be. And hence the need for this type of episode and the relationship that, that Brent had with the civil engineer group and, and I'm sure other units throughout his time as a contracting officer in order to try to find that way to yes through the existing constraints on the system. We have that mandate. We have that responsibility to do that for our airmen. Yeah. And I'm smiling over here because I joined the Air Force thinking I was going to be a scientist, having no concept of how important the money aspect would be and that I would have to understand budgets and finance and that I would have to understand philosophy and international policy. And the list goes on, right, of the things that we have to know in order to be good at our jobs. And I'm really glad there are dedicated professionals who are much better at this than I am that I can ask these questions to because I, I, I've only got so much space up here between the years, Colin, 
and and to have people like Brent who are passionate, understand the system and can approach problems in the way that they do. I'm I'm glad they're on my team. Yep, for sure. And that then goes to my next point that I want to highlight is that we need to practice explaining what you just said to the outside world that we come in thinking, okay, I'm just going to be a pilot. I'm just going to be an engineer. I'm just going to be a contracting officer, Intel officer, maintenance officer, logistics, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, all officers are essentially responsible for the same thing and need to be able to explain to the civilian world because as we've explained in previous episodes, you are going to leave the service and you're going to have to go get a new line of employment. So practice explaining what you are capable of, what the military has taught you so that you can use it when you move on to your next thing. Yes, I'm responsible for the mission and I became a tactical and technical expert in that thing. But I also gained all these other abilities, such as you highlighted, the ability to manage resources, lead airmen, negotiate contracts, write statements of work, whatever, right? All those things that add value to your next employer. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we don't want our audience to misunderstand, too, right? When you are a lieutenant first or second and a new captain, you should absolutely 100% be focused on becoming tactically and technically proficient. That is your job. But we just don't want you to only do that so that when the time comes for you to either A, transition out or B, accept more responsibility, that you fall short when that time comes because that time's going to come, right? Either you stay in and you gain more responsibilities, feel great officer and move up the chain of command or you separate and now you can only offer, at least in your mind, a limited skill set that may not have very much applicability in the civilian world. I don't know about you, Colin, but I don't know too many, you know, civilian employers who drop bombs. I'm not really familiar with that. I, I mean, maybe, maybe ski resorts, you know, as some sort of avalanche control or remediation, but even that's artillery, which isn't air force. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you become so, so burdened with only becoming a tactician and technician when the time comes for you to move out of that you may not be successful so that's i think what we're trying to give folks is that mindset and brent really demonstrated that well i thought he had that from the get-go yeah and let's be grateful he's engaged now in the effort of helping other people learn from his experience in fighting the good fight while in the air force but then preparing and transitioning well into whatever comes next. Yeah, and that leads me to the last thing I wanted to bring up today. It, you said it right there at the end, fighting the good fight. I really appreciated how he talked about the importance of pushing all the way to the end. And we can talk about this in a couple of ways, and I'm going to look at it from two perspectives. So one, the member themselves, you absolutely have to push all the way through the end. Whether it's, in a training environment, you know, and you're, you're going to field training or you're going through OTS or SOS is coming, whatever it is, you're going to a training environment. Universally, the crazy, dumb, are you kidding me moments that happened while I was an instructor happened within the last 96 hours of training. Same with deployments, you know, the accidental discharge where they shoot themselves in the foot or something obscenely stupid happens right at the end and it's almost always because the end is in sight people start thinking about the next thing and i'm going to invoke my yoda here they stop focusing on where they are and what they're doing their minds always look into the future and they take their eye off the ball and so for the member got to push to the end because we are in dangerous business and that's when things will happen and it can be Little things like you say some comment off the cuff that is in a pro whatever it is, right? You, you take your eye off the ball and it's always at the end. So you got to push through. On, on the flip side, let's think about pushing through the end 
when you're leading people who are maybe getting out or separating or getting to the end of something, it's your responsibility to push them to the end, to not only keep them out of trouble, but it's your responsibility as a leader to develop people all the way until they're across the finish line, whatever that finish line is for them. I've seen it before. And you'll hear people when they start thinking about getting out, they're worried about telling their leadership that they're getting out because they're worried they're going to miss out on opportunities. And I can empathize with that perspective, right? If I've got two airmen, roughly the same situation, career, life, whatever, rank position, and I know one is getting out in six months, and I've got another one that's going to still be in for a couple of years, who am I going to send to the TDY to get additional skills to apply to my mission? I think it's understandable for people to send the person who's going to stay in. But is that right? Or have you given up on the person that they're both still in your unit? They're both still accomplishing the mission. I'm not, I'm not saying this is you know a cut and dry example. I'm just putting this out there as people can understand how development kind of ends when people have decided that they're out. But until they are out, until they walk away with their DD-214 blanket and they start growing their hair, like they're not out. And we owe it to them to continue to develop them. Yeah, absolutely. One of the phrases that sticks with me from my childhood, my dad would always tell me, you need to hoe to the end of the row. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And so I, I'm glad that Brent gave us that opportunity to, to bring up that message. You can apply it wherever you are in your life circumstance. Push all the way to the end. You'll avoid a whole lot of trouble and pain. Yeah. Thank you so much to Brent, to Captain Nichols for uh, taking us uh, through contracting, through various dis different aspects of the transition. Again, want to encourage everybody to go check out his podcast, Corporate Captains, so that you are in a better position to fight that fight all the way into the end. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. We love to hear from you. Engage with us on Facebook, Instagram or email. We love to hear from you. We're looking forward to being with you again shortly. And thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Thank you for listening to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. The views and opinions of the authors expressed herein do not state or reflect those of the government and shall not be used for advertising or product endorsement purposes. Mention of any specific commercial products, process, or service by trade name, trademark, manufacturer, or otherwise does not necessarily constitute nor imply its endorsement, recommendation, or favoring by the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement.